Hello, in this video we're going to talk about endometriosis, which is uh, the presence of endometrial glands and stroma outside the uterine cavity and the uterine musculature. So here is a girl, lady, with endometriosis. And during periods, she gets terrible period pain and pelvic pain. Let's first revise some anatomy to understand endometriosis. So here's a female genital tract, the vagina, cervix, uterus, and ovary. The fallopian tube is here, also known as the uterine tube. Zooming into the uterus, let's talk about the layers. So the innermost layer, which is closest to the cavity, the uterine cavity, this first layer is called the endometrium. And below it is the muscular myometrium, and below that is the perimetrium. Along the myometrium, you have branches of the uterine artery, which has more branches called the spiral arteries that actually go all the way up to the endometrium. These spiral arteries are what helps the endometrium grow during each menstrual uh, cycle because it helps deliver hormones and nutrients. The endometrial layer, the endometrium, is the layer which sheds during periods and a, a new layer will grow and essentially the endometrium becomes thick once again. However, a woman with a normal reproductive tract can develop endometriosis. And as we have learned, endometriosis is where you have the presence of endometrial tissue outside the uterine cavity and uterine musculature. And because it's endometrial tissue, the endometrial tissue will also react to the hormones. And so when you have period, it will also react. So let's take a closer look at what's going on. So you, here you have um, the left ovary, the fallopian tube, and the uterus. Here is the uterine cavity. And the innermost layer, the layer that reacts to the hormones and sheds, is the endometrium. Here is endometrial tissue that are present outside the uterus, and this is characteristic of endometriosis. The pathophysiology is not fully known, but there are a few theories out there. And to put it simply, there are four. One is that it occurs due to retrograde menstruation or vascular lymphatic dissemination, um, cholemic metaplasia of uh, multipotent cells, or because of impaired immunity. And we'll look more um, into each of these theories in the pathophysiology section later on. But let's talk about the clinical presentation. And usually endometriosis uh, presents in younger women, between 20 and 30, or 30 and 40. And usually symptoms are bad, heavy periods. They can present with chronic fatigue, also, infertility is a common presentation, not being able to conceive. Chronic pelvic pain is very common. Severe dysmenorrhea, which is painful menstruation. They, they can also have deep dyspareunia, which is deep pain during sexual intercourse. And also, they can have symptoms of pain during defecation. Endometriosis should be considered in any patient, really, female patient with dysmenorrhea who are not responding with non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs. It's good to remember the symptoms of endometriosis as the four Ds. And to remember it better, let's draw a diagram looking at a sagittal section of the female pelvis. So we're talking about the four Ds. The first D is dysmenorrhea, which is essentially painful, heavy bleeding. Dysuria, which is pain urinating, if there is ectopic endometrial tissues on the bladder, for example. There's dyskesia, which is pain discomfort upon defecation. And this is usually if there's an ectopic endometrial tissue uh, on the bowel or the rectal area. And the final D is dyspyrunia, which is pain during sexual intercourse. There are many differential diagnoses of endometriosis because there are many causes of chronic pelvic pain or you know, painful bleeding. We can 
we can divide these uh, differential diagnoses into gynecological and non-gynecological differential diagnosis. Let's look at the gynecological uh, first. And these include adenomyosis, which are endometrial glands found in the, endo, uh, in the myometrium. And this will also react to hormones during each menstrual cycle. Another differential is lyomyomas, which are essentially fibroids, and they can cause similar symptoms. Then there is pelvic inflammatory disease, which is mainly caused by STIs, and it's, very, and it's a very common cause of chronic pelvic pain. Then you have uterine myomas, as well as ovarian cysts, both of which are um, common, more so the ovarian cyst. Differential diagnosis of a non-gynecological cause include irritable bowel syndrome, inflammatory bowel disease, and interstitial cystitis, which is inflammation of the bladders um, in, in interstitium. Investigations to order for someone presenting with suspected endometriosis includes a full blood count. And this is to check for any signs of infection, anemia, um, also checking uh, electrolyte urea creatinine to check for kidney function. Then you can also perform an abdominal and transvaginal ultrasound, which is actually very important. And it's first line, and it's to see if any obvious anatomical changes in the reproductive or non-reproductive organs. Imaging such as an MRI and, uh, or CT scan can often help also detect abnormalities uh, around the area and can also detect sometimes ectopic endometrial tissues. Finally, there is a laparoscopy, which is actually used to diagnose endometriosis and is the gold standard. Laparoscopies are done under general anesthetics. But it should be noted that even if a doctor suspects endometriosis, it doesn't mean that the patient has to have a laparoscopy because management will be the same regardless or a trial medication will happen regardless. And so patients go on medications to see if it helps without having surgery, without confirming the diagnosis of endometriosis. Although the exact mechanism of endometriosis is unknown, there are some possibly known risk factors, including a low birth weight, early menarche, short menstrual cycle, late menopause, certain genes, genetics, and eating heaps of red meat is also a risk factor, obesity, and certain chemicals increase your chances of developing endometriosis. But there are also protective factors, and these include fruits, vegetables, having multiple pregnancies, omega-3 oil, as well as prolonged breastfeeding, prolonged lactation. So we touched on the pathophysiology of endometriosis briefly. Let's now take a closer look. Here is the brain and here is the female uh, genital tract. The female reproductive tract has blood supply, of course. The most inner layer of the uterus uh, is the endometrium, the layer which sheds during the period. In the brain, there is uh, what's called the pituitary gland, which is an endocrine gland that produces a hormone called luteinizing hormone in response to uh, gonadotropin releasing hormone from the hypothalamus. Anyway, luteinizing hormone, or LH, um, its role is to cause or induce ovulation. So it targets the ovaries, telling it to release an egg at day 14 of the female reproductive cycle, so mid-cycle. The egg will then travel through the fallopian tube and will either be fertilized or not fertilized by the sperm. Let us say that there is no fertilization, that there is no sperm. And with no fertilization means that menstruation will occur um, in two weeks. So this person will have a period in two weeks. So during this time before the period, the ovary is actually still producing estrogen and progesterone. But by day 28 of the female reproductive cycle, 
the estrogen and progesterone levels drop. And with the drop of estrogen and progesterone, this actually will somewhat allow for menstruation. It will stimulate, you can say, menstruation. And so the endometrial lining will shed and you get a period. In endometriosis, because you have endometrial tissues elsewhere outside the uterine cavity, this ectopic endometrial tissue will also react to the drop in hormones and they will also shed, you can say. And this will cause really painful periods, dysmenorrhea. If the ectopic endometrial tissue was on the bowel or the rectum, it can cause dyskesia during uh, periods. Endometriosis can also cause dyspyrunia because of the sensitive um, genital tract. And if the endometrial tissue is present on the bladder, for example, if there's ectopic tissue is there, it can cause dysuria. Just remember the four Ds. So how does the endometrial tissue actually end up outside the uterine cavity or the myometrium in the first place? Well, one common theory is the, that, that there's retrograde menstruation, whereby during menstruation, some of the endometrial tissue may have traveled backwards, retrograde, back along the fallopian tubes into the surrounding peritoneal cavity. Another theory is the vascular and lymphatic dissemination of the endometrial cells theory. And here, this, it's, a, it's essentially thought that the endometrial tissues move via the vasculature or the lymphatic from the uterus and deposit as elsewhere in the peritoneal cavity. The third theory is based on the cholemic metaplasia of multipotent uh, cells in the peritoneal cavity. Here, the ectopic endometrial tissue is thought to come from cholemic epithelial cells that undergo uh, what's called a metaplastic uh, reaction or metaplasia. So if I'm not mistaken, basically the um, cholemic cells develop into cells of the peritoneum and the surface of the ovary usually. However, um, here the cholemic cells undergo metaplasia and it actually causes these cells to transform into endometrial cells but the cells are, are not present in the uterus. Rather, they, they, they uh, become uh, present, you know, outside the uterus. Finally, the fourth theory of endometriosis is an impairment of the immune, immune system. But I won't really go into this because I'm not really sure how that works. So that was the pathophysiology. Now let's focus on the pathology of endometriosis. And we can, and it can be gross or microscopic depending on, I guess, the severity or the type of endometriosis. And there are three pathological forms. The first is just endo, uh, endometriosis within the ovary. So it's an ovarian lesion. Here, the ovarian cyst is formed by ectopic endometrial tissue. This is known now as an endometrioma. The second pathological form is, is the superficial peritoneal lesion. And typically, this type is located on pelvic organs or pelvic peritoneum. And it has a characteristic powder burn or gunshot lesion appearance. The third pathological form is deep infiltrative endometriosis. And this is a solid endometriosis mass situated greater than five millimeters deep under the peritoneal surface. And this type more likely than not requires some sort of surgical intervention. Which brings us to the last part of the video, which is management or second last part. So management includes symptomatic management, which, can, uh, which uh, includes non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. But there's also hormonal treatment. And the hormonal treatment, the aim is essentially to mimic pregnancy, to mimic menopause, thereby preventing menstruation. And there are many hormonal treatments. Let's see how they work. Here is the brain and the female reproductive tract. The hypothalamus produces gonadotropin-releasing hormone, GNRH, which stimulates the pituitary to release 
luteinizing hormone, LH. When LH, luteinizing hormone, is high, it will stimulate ovulation in the ovaries. And as we know, the eggs are released, the egg is released. Early on, after ovulation, estrogen and progesterone are produced. And this actually sends a negative feedback to the hypothalamus, telling it to stop producing gonadotropin-releasing hormone. And because gonadotropin-releasing hormone is in inhibited, everything stops. Some medication used to treat endometriosis works on different parts of this diagram. So for example, gonadotropin-releasing hormone agonists is a drug that can be used for endometriosis. And how this works is that by stimulating gonadotropin-releasing hormone, you are stimulating the production of estrogen and progesterone, which will maintain um, the, the endometrial lining, and so you do not have periods. Then there's also the combined oral contraceptive pill, basically estrogen and progesterone, which means that you have more of these hormones, which means that you will stop the, the, the cycle, essentially, the menstrual cycle. You stop menstruating. Then you have progestogens, which is basically the hormone progesterone, and it does the same thing. It you know, prevents or lowers um, the heavy bleeding in, in the reproductive cycle. Marina is another treatment, which uh, is where a device, an umbrella-looking device, is placed inside the uterine cavity. The Marina releases hormones locally, progesterone, which then inhibits menstruation. Um, it is good because, unlike the oral contraceptive pill, the Marina acts only locally and so does not actually have a systemic effect like the oral contraceptive pill. The Marina and all these other hormonal treatments are also very effective in thinning the lining of the endometrium. And so you, you do have a lighter period as well. So we just talked about symptomatic treatment, hormonal treatment, and finally there is surgical treatment. And the aim of the surgical treatment is to eliminate all visible peritoneal lesions, endometriomas, and to try to restore normal anatomy. And there are three main surgical options. There is laparoscopic ablation of ectopic endometrial tissues. There is open surgery with local resection. And there is hysterectomy plus minus oophorectomy in serious cases. One thing I have not added here is treatment of infertility, as this is also common in people who have endometriosis. Finally, it's important to talk about the complications of endometriosis, which include mainly infertility, development of adhesions because of inflammation or post-surgery, ovarian failure post-operation, People who have endometriosis also have an increased risk of autoimmune diseases or predisposition to autoimmune diseases, as well as mental health.